So today we're going to talk about ozone and how it's created and destroyed and the benefits and for this class we're focusing on stratospheric ozone and later on we'll learn about ozone as an air pollutant but right now this is a good stuff. Okay so before we can actually talk about ozone we have to make sure we're all familiar with ultraviolet light because ozone is going to help us get rid of that stuff. Um, remember that the light coming from the sun comes in a lot of different wavelengths. So up here we're looking at all of the different wavelengths, meaning there's a very short distance between waves or very long distance between waves. And what you'll notice is that as the wavelengths decrease, they give you more energy. And comparing visible light here to ultraviolet light, UV light, they have, the wavelengths of ultraviolet light have much more energy per photon than visible light. And the problem with that is that ultraviolet light is so strong that it can actually break the bonds in molecules um, because there's so much energy in it. And what that means for us on a very basic <laughs> self uh, self-interested level, is that if our DNA absorbs that ultraviolet light, that energy, this can break the bonds in DNA. And that is how mutations can happen, which can lead to cancer. So break DNA's bonds. So as we've already talked about, here we are on Earth, and um, the first layer of the atmosphere is the troposphere, which is where all our weather and climate occurs. And as you move out of that, you get into the stratosphere. And this is relevant because the sun, way over here, casting light, including ultraviolet light, as it comes down, it has to go through the stratosphere before it gets to Earth. And so then the fact that the ozone layer exists is particularly helpful to us. It's further away from we are, from us on Earth, and it's going to absorb a lot of that stratospheric, sorry, that ultraviolet light from the sun. And the reason it exists out there is that here we've got enough gravity to um, keep the oxygen and the ozone together and dense enough to be useful, but it also is farther away or between us and the sun, which is really the most important point. Okay, so let's actually talk about ozone and oxygen and how they're related and where this stuff comes from. So here's ozone. It's an O3 molecule, three atoms of oxygen uh, bonded together, so triple bonded. Um, we might also write it O, 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 like that. Um, then normally when we're talking about oxygen, as in humans need oxygen to survive, we're talking about O2. Two oxygen atoms double bonded to one another. So clearly these things are related to one another, um, but how you go back and forth is the tricky part. This is a very, very stable molecule. Um, there are two bonds. I mean, it's not going to be falling apart anytime soon. And this is a very stable molecule. So in order for anything to happen, to make any kind of changes between these two, you have to have a lot of energy. And that's where the ultraviolet light comes in. So you start off with oxygen molecules and ultraviolet light, huge input of energy, breaks the bonds. And you form something where you have a single oxygen atom, and I'm not going to balance this right now, but you have a single oxygen atom that is unstable by itself. We often call these um, oxygen radicals. And like I said, really unstable. It can't hang out by itself, kind of like a 
you know, tween girl. Um, and what happens is this oxygen atom is going to find another oxygen molecule. And it's con going to combine with that. And because it's so unstable, um, it can actually sort of insert itself into the situation. And we create a new molecule that has three oxygens, one, two, three, um, and is ozone. And the nice thing about that is that that ultraviolet light, that energy that was super intensive and could damage our DNA, is now in the bonds of this O3 atom, uh, O3 molecule, meaning it no longer was traveling from the sun to earth. It got taken up and transferred, uh, first law of thermodynamics, and now that ultraviolet light doesn't get to us. So that's a good thing. The great thing about ozone is that the reverse reaction also absorbs ultraviolet light. So when that ozone uh, absorbs some ultraviolet light, we get another oxygen-free radical. And if two of those find each other, um, you can create more oxygen molecules. So again, both going sort of in the forward direction, O2 to O3, that absorbs ultraviolet light, and O3 to O2, that absorbs ultraviolet light. In both situations, you are taking ultraviolet light from the sun and preventing it from reaching Earth. Yay! Um, and so sometimes people will call the ozone layer the Earth's sunglasses or something equally silly. The ozone layer, all good, and um, the only problem arises when progress um, and chemistry meet. Um, we designed, as humans, um, some chemicals, and one of them is referred to as CFC, which stands for, for chloro, look little chlorines there, fluoro, the fluorine, uh, fluoride, and uh, carbon. There's that carbon in the middle, so CFC. And um, this is a set of chemicals, or belongs to a set of chemicals that are involved in um, things like aerosols, the propellants in aerosols, uh, refrigerants like Freon, uh, very closely related to that. And very, very, very stable molecule um, exists for a long time, which makes it a persistent compound. Um, but like, um, like oxygen and ozone, it can get broken down by ultraviolet light because that's really strong energy. And when that happens, what, what results, uh, ultraviolet light plus some um, CFC in the stratosphere for the most part, results in the chlorine ion popping off. Um, and this is what we're going to focus on, the chlorine ion. Okay, so we already talked about the fact that naturally what happens is ozone is combining with ultraviolet light, that ultraviolet light breaks bonds, and ultimately we produce um, oxygen molecules, and the reverse process happens, absorbs more ultraviolet light. What happens when we bring chlorine into all of this is that chlorine is very um, reactive. It, it can't hang out by itself, and it finds ozone very attractive. So it combines with one of the oxygens in the ozone to make ClO, which is also called chlorine monoxide, and oxygen. This, however, is not a stable molecule. It doesn't stick around a long time. It can break apart very easily into chlorine ion and oxygen-free radical. Well, we already know that the oxygen-free radical can either combine with another oxygen-free radical to make 
uh, O2, or it can combine with an O2 molecule to make O3. Um, so that we already know about. The issue is that chlorine ion, hey, that's what just started this whole process. And there was not a single ultraviolet light photon absorbed in all of this. No UV light needed. So what happened to that ultraviolet light that could have been absorbed? It kept going um, and reaches Earth's surface. And if we keep doing this a lot, we end up with much more ultraviolet light hitting the surface of the Earth. And that's undesirable. I mean, humans aren't the only things that can get cancers when ultraviolet light is absorbed by DNA. It can damage plants, it can damage animals, um, and it's just, it's not what organisms on Earth adapted to. So that's why the big issue arises. So that's, the problem with all of this um, CFC stuff is that over time, it can really uh, break down more ozone than is being formed. And this happens especially towards the poles where less direct light um, means less ozone is forming naturally. And we end up with what are called ozone holes, which really just means there are areas where the ozone is less thick. I mean, you couldn't say that there was a hole in the atmosphere, right? Um, but it's less dense. There's less ozone present. And that's particularly problematic in um, South Africa, South America, Lower South America, and Australia, where they have had higher rates of cancer, uh, skin cancer especially, because of all that ultraviolet light that is hitting. Now, the good part about this, and what you might notice if you've been looking at this diagram for a while is that um, over time uh, we've seen improvements and that's not not a natural thing that's because humans and multiple countries got together and uh, ratified the Montreal Protocol and that was set in place in the late 1980s um, it was actually signed in 1987 and countries actually started uh, abiding by the rules to decrease um, CFC production in 1989. And while there are years when it gets better and worse, overall the amount of uh, CFCs in our atmosphere and the stratosphere has slowly been decreasing, and we are seeing progress in terms of um, that ozone hole sort of quote-unquote closing and we're certainly seeing lower rates of skin cancer. Um, and for the most part, it's one of the best examples of international cooperation. In fact, that's what Kofi Annan refers to it as in terms of great um, global interaction and cooperation is the best word for it um, on an international scale to resolve a global problem. So. Um, that's why we have a lot of high expectations and hope that Montreal Protocol success could be repeated in things like the Kyoto Protocol. Um, again, that's just another international agreement, but um, we haven't seen the same kind of success with that. Um, Montreal Protocol was really just aimed at reducing CFC production, and um, people could could see direct results, they could see direct causation, and that's why it was easy to get a lot of people to sign on and to really change their behavior. So this is a very successful international agreement um, and gives environmental sort of hope for the future. And of course, for the sake of our chemistry students, the technical proper balanced reaction would be three oxygen molecules combining with ultraviolet light gives oxygen free radicals, two of them, 